On episode 216 of the Tennis Files podcast, you'll learn why the contact point determines your success in tennis with coach Vesa Ponka. Hey there, welcome back to this episode of the podcast. This is Mirbon, and it's great to have you back on listening or listening for the first time, if that is the case. And today we have on Coach Vesa Ponka to talk about why the contact point determines your success in tennis. And that may be a bold statement, but after listening to this episode, I do think that you'll really uh, have a different light shown upon this very important concept in tennis. And even by just concentrating on the contact point alone for both yourself and your opponent and how to disturb that uh, for them, that will really. Uh, make a huge difference in your game. So, Vesa is the Senior Director of Tennis at the Junior Tennis Champions Center, which is home to amazing pros Francis Tiafo, Dennis Kudla, and numerous other elite players. Vesa was selected as the 2011 USOC National Developmental Coach of the Year and has trained top junior players in the United States and Europe. Uh, he, his students have also won numerous professional and national titles achieved the number one ITF Junior World Ranking, several number one USDA national rankings, and NCAA All-American honors. And VESA's coaching certifications include USPTA, USPTR, and USTA high performance. So on the show today, you're going to learn why the contact point is so important to your game, the negative effects of not having a good contact point, the different factors that determine where your ideal contact point is, how to hit the ball at the right contact point consistently, why using your eyes and your brain are the most critical to a good contact point, why you'll be able to hit more powerful, heavier shots with a consistent contact point. I know I'm saying contact point a billion times, but I think that's going to help you (laughs) remember this amazing concept that uh, is crucial to your game. Uh, So we'll learn about all that and more on this episode. And before we go into the episode, I do have to do something very important, which is tell you the pun of the day. I love puns. I don't know how many of you like them, uh, if you like it, but I will say it anyway, and let's see. So uh, the pun of the day is, I like my breakfast, like my tennis serve grip, continental. (laughs) I hope you like that one. Please don't shut off the the podcast. I promise that's the only pun in this episode, I think. Uh, Ironically, I just finished my breakfast. Um, But I do hope that you enjoy this episode. And again, the contact point, it's huge. Uh, A lot of times we think about the technique instead of the contact point, but it's really the other way around that you should be thinking about these concepts uh, as you'll learn on the episode. So without further ado... Here is my episode, or here is my interview with Coach Vesa Ponka. Hey guys, I'm Mirban Aranchad, and we're here at the 2017 Tennis Technique Summit to talk about the importance of the contact point in high performance training with Vesa Ponka from the Junior Tennis uh, Champion Center. Uh, Vesa is Senior Director of Tennis at JTCC, and he holds PTR, USPTA, and USTA high performance certifications. Uh, Vesa has done uh, a ton of great coaching work with amazing students who have won numerous professional and national titles. They've achieved the number one ITF Junior World Ranking, several number one USC national rankings, and NCAA All-American honors. Uh, So a wide variety of players uh, with amazing accomplishments. Vesa has also trained top junior players in the United States and Europe for national uh, NCAA, ITF, and professional competition. Uh, Vesa was honored by being selected as the 2011 USOC National Development Coach of the Year. And I first met Vesa as a young junior, and I remember taking a private lesson with Vesa back then, and it was one of the best and also toughest I've ever had. So, uh, Vesa, it's a real pleasure to have you on the summit, uh, and I really want to thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you. It's it's a pleasure to be here and good to see you after 15 years <laughs> thank you you too you too you haven't haven't changed much so 
Um, yeah, and I mean, like I said, JTCC, world-class training facility with amazing coaches like yourself. Uh, we're also very lucky to have uh, Megan Moulton-Levy, who I believe helped with the tech portion here for us. Uh, and she's a great coach and player. Uh, she's on the summit, a uh, great guest. So Vesa, you know, I'm really excited to talk to you about really the impact of the contact point in our game. That's uh, something that a lot of players don't focus on. They focus more on what the racket is doing and things like that, which is also important. But I mean, the contact point is really uh, very important. And I want to ask you first off, why why the contact point is so important for us? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, you mentioned it that the a lot of players, they concentrate on other stuff than contact point. And I think that it's our fault as a coaches. Actually, as a coaches, we really need to get our message through how important the contact point is in everything, you know, technical, tactical, fitness, physical, mental, emotional aspect of the game. Um, basically, I'm going to make a really bold statement here. I feel that the contact point actually determines your success in the game. Uh, that's how important it is. It's basically, in my book, it's a center of all the learning. You know, you know, all the technique depends on the contact point, all the physical footwork, it all related to the contact point. So I'm glad to talk about it because um, I spend a fair amount of time talking to the coaches around the country and we always talk about the swing path and this and that, but very seldom we talk about the contact point, which actually really determines your success. Right. That's a great point, Vesa. You know, I don't hear this much from coaches either, but I have heard from some great coaches like Roberto Brogan, for instance, who I just uh, talked with, uh, used to be Jeannie Bouchard's coach. And he, you know, he was saying it really doesn't matter too much what's happening before you contact the ball. So there's definitely some coaches who are obviously have your viewpoint, even though it's kind of rare, but extremely important. Um, and just maybe if you briefly could just go through a couple you know, issues that are caused by not having uh, an optimal contact point. Okay, no, I think that the first thing that goes wrong, uh, like I said, um, as a coach, we are so busy trying to teach every part of the game, and it also actually should start that we define what is the individual contact point for our student's stroke, let's say the forehand. Um, you know, there are different factors, you know, there's a, the grip will will have a, is a factor, you know, the, the stance, you know, is it a closed, open, or semi? But uh, we actually have to, what I do a lot, and sometimes it works well, is I actually ask the student, you know, tell me where do you think that you hit your very best ball? And um, I'm always surprised how they are showing 10 different spots, you know, 10 different spots, and almost uh, have to really show them, then hey, how about if you try this spot, spot and, and, and let's see if, you know, your weight is moving through, when the ball is in, in a certain spot. And it's almost like physically and visually, we have to show the young players, this might be your sweet spot. This might be your contact point. And then everything starts to start to start from there. When we start to add the, the swing and, and, and the footwork and all that stuff. But the young player really have to be aware where the ideal contact point is. Can you give us a couple, uh, you know, insights into the, the process that that you uh, and your coaches go through to actually try to find the ideal contact point for the player? Yeah, it, uh, like I said, um, you know, first, you know, we have to make check out the creep of the player. You know, you know, let's I give you an example of, you know, let's say, you know, you have a continental creep for the forehand. That doesn't happen a lot anymore. But, uh, you know, if you have a continental, eastern, semi and western. So basically, you know. Continental contact point is much lower than the, you know, the Western. And so it goes continental, Eastern, semi and Western. And, you know, the contact point just gets higher. Then you have to factor in what is their stance, let's say in the forehand, you know, are they hitting with the open stand, mostly closed or, or semi. So now, you know, you have to, you know, take that one into account. And um, basically, you know, you have to work very close with the player, you know, do some hitting, maybe some even tossing, so you really isolate it and ask them that when they feel that, hey, this feels like I get my weight moving through the hitting zone and, and this might be my my contact point because we have to remember grip and the footwork and the foot stance will determine kind of the hitting zone contact point, but it's still an it's individual thing and we have to take that one into account. But um, first, you know, have to check out the grip then about the stance, and then that kind of determines, you know, 
where that contact point is to that individual player. Gotcha, Vesa. That's great stuff. And does the contact point also vary among the different uh, types of stroke, you know, like volleys versus forehands and backhands and stuff as well? Yes, that's that's again a great point because as a coach, sometimes we get a little lazy. You know, we say that, um, hey, the contact point needs to be in the front. You know, that's, you know, there's a lot of space and room in the front. You know, it's, you know, there are 10 miles that way. And, and, and you know, so I think that we have to be very specific. And uh, basically the good contact point in every stroke is slightly in the front and the whole body is, is um, supporting that point. So if it's a volley or, or backhand or whatever it is, your body should should be supporting that contact point. But like I said, uh, you know, every stroke has it differently, but, uh, you know, it has to be in the right spot so the player's weight moves through the hitting zone when they are executing the stroke. Gotcha, Pesa. That's great stuff. And, um, you know, obviously the contact point is extremely important. How does... A, a bad contact point div- affect the technique of the stroke itself. Okay, no, that we, I think that we see that one a lot. Um, it's just simply the quality is not there. I mean, we can muscle the balls, but, uh, you know, first of all, it doesn't feel the same. It feels like you are forcing the stroke. Um, of course, you know, if your weight is not moving through the ball, then, of course, it's not as heavy as it could be. Um, if you are not able to finish the stroke with uh, pressing the outside of the ball, then then, you know, you might not have a, enough rotation. So basically, to answer your question, the quality of the stroke suffers right away. It doesn't mean that we cannot execute it and make the ball, but it might not have the same heaviness and, and, and the pace than when the contact point is exactly in the right spot. And I always like to talk with the players that when the contact point is right, it's so much fun to hit the tennis ball. And that's kind of important. It's a motivational factor for the young players too, that when they find their contact point, it, this game becomes much, much more fun, and the quality of the hitting goes up. Gotcha. And um, I'm also curious as to the types of skills of the player that uh, influence uh, whether they have a good contact point. I mean, one that I can think of is uh, ball tracking and perception. But what are some variables that uh, you think that are really important that will help players develop a, a better contact point? Again, you know, it starts from the fact that you have to be looking for it, then you have to be aware where your own contact point is. And then we come to the to the most effective and most common advice that coaches always give, but we don't really explain it well enough, is we always tell everybody, watch the ball careful. And, and that is a loaded instruction. We actually really have to explain what does it mean. So we try to follow the ball or the player tries to follow the ball all the way to the contact point, keeping the eyes at the contact point even after the stroke is done. So the head stays still and the racket can move through the contact point freely to the right direction. You can, we all have seen those great pictures of Federer and those guys, you know, how the eyes are staying still when the racket is through the ball. And um, so watching the ball and learning to pay attention to keeping the head still at that contact point is extremely important. It's just, again, I don't think that we explain it well enough. We we repeat it all the time. I'm, I'm guilty of it every day. I just keep on telling players, watch the ball, you know, track the ball, but I don't really explain what it means. And it means that, you know, you keep your eyes, you know, in that contact point as long as possible. Gotcha, Vesa. Are there any particular drills that come to mind that you uh, make your players go through to help them uh, watch the ball yeah you know they are these old timeless drills you know you can uh, you know uh, you know monica Seles's dad used to draw cartoon figures in the ball and and so to keep monica's you know eyes on the ball uh, you know we can have a different nowadays it's great when you have these different kind of colored balls you know red balls and orange balls and you know you ask the players to track the ball and then you toss a couple of balls and they have to hit a certain number or certain color of the ball. So your limit is basically your your imagination. You know, the main thing is that uh, they are mentally engaged and, and they are absolutely paying attention to the ball when it's coming close to that contact point. And one thing that I have learned is really effective with the young players and it's kind of fun to do. You actually ask them to evaluate their own quality of the stroke, how it felt. Is if, if if that was the right contact point that everything felt really good. And that's really powerful way to get them to be aware 
how it feels when the ball was in that right contact point and their eyes stayed on it and they were in a great balance. So, you know, because self-correction is actually extremely important way to learn. And of course, when they are on the on the mat, so in the, on the court by themselves, they have to have the tools to fix it all by themselves. Gotcha, Vesa. And you mentioned, which was uh, really useful to the, to the audience, uh, along with everything else you're saying, of, of how the different grips, uh, you know, different heights for different grips, where the Western is the highest one. How about as far as, um, you know, far in front in general, you know, it, when you compare like a continental to semi-Western, Western and such and Eastern, uh, it, are some balls uh, for those grips, should they be hit more in front than the other grips or anything? Or Yeah, you can say that, uh, that you know, let's say continental is hit maybe the closest to, you know, that, uh, you know, not so much in the front, just because the fact of the of the of how the hand is over the over the over the creep but um, basically more extreme creep you have more it's going to be in the front but it's also going to be closer to your body so when you have a semi let's say him actually heavy western creep you know actually elbow is pretty close to your body and contact point is in the front but you know you don't really have a lot of spacing between your elbow and your body then, of course, if you have an Eastern or, or very few players have a Continental anymore, but then, you know, you have a little bit more space and the contact point is a little bit more on the side. So, but again, I want to really make sure that, you know, it's, it's, it's important. Everybody still have their individual favorite spot to hit the ball. It will, you know, the creep will determine a lot and stance, but they still have their own spot that as a coaches, we have to help them to find. Gotcha. So at the end of the day, it really what it boils down to is it's going to be where, you know, when you strike the ball, you're going to feel it to be the most clean and, uh, you know, efficient and powerful in a sense. Absolutely. And, you know, as we know, you know, the secret of hitting the ball hard is not trying to hit hard. And to repeat that feeling is really important guideline to the players. So that's why the contact point, when it's right, it feels like nothing. I mean, I always felt that... Uh, that is the big, the best marketing or promotional tool for us, you know, to get young kids to engage with this game. Because when, when you hit that ball the right way, there's nothing like it. It feels so good. And I think that that gets hooked a lot of players. It used to be a little bit different when we were playing with the wooden rackets. You just have to work so hard to get that one spot right. But then when you got it, it felt like a million dollars. Now with the new rackets, it's, you know, we can be a little bit careless and still send a really good ball to the other side. But um, I know for the fact, personally, but also with the hundreds and hundreds of junior players, it feels so good. And I can see in their eyes when they find their contact point. And then, you know, they get motivated to find it again and again. And that's when really learning will take place. So it's also, you know, the contact phone has an impact on mental and emotional part of this game too, which actually is extremely important. Gotcha, Vesa. Um, and another part of this is really the, the implication of, uh, you know, how footwork affects the contact point. Uh, so I want to jump there for now and just ask you, I mean, basically the same thing. How does footwork affect how good of a contact point the player has? Okay, that's, again, that is such an important question. And, and as a coach, the whole purpose of moving well is to find your contact point. You know, when you are moving, you know, your first part is to get close to the ball get to the ball, the second part is to be behind the ball. So uh, the purpose of moving on the tennis court is to find your contact point and be behind it. So you can actually load your legs behind that contact point and then unload and go through the ball. And that's why, you know, your footwork is actually has to be defined by finding your spot, finding your contact point. And it again can be fun for the players when they really understand it. That it's not only to get to the ball, but to get right behind the contact point and hit a great ball. So I feel like, uh, you know, again, get some players to move even better and be more precise with their footwork is when they understand where their individual contact point is. And they make it almost like a, a challenge or competition. How many times I can get my legs behind that, uh, that ball in the right way? And if you look at the pro players, that is the biggest difference between players who are really getting paid a lot of money to play this game and then players who are not. How precise they are with the ball. Maybe 
most of the time they are behind the ball the right way and as a result the quality of their hitting is slightly better than the opponents and that's when they start to dictate so footwork is huge part of the contact point and again you have to fight for it I, I use the term that the young players have to take it as a challenge you have to fight for that contact point i like that mentality that's very motivating actually um and so kind of the reverse question in a sense uh let's say in high level junior players or maybe college players what are some mistakes in the footwork that you see with them that you correct sometimes that will of course lead to a deficient contact point that you've seen okay now then uh, one of the big ones of course we all know when we are late you know nothing nothing feels good you know basically you have been for different reasons you are late from the ball and and you have to muscle the ball and we know how that one feels we can maybe make the ball but it doesn't feel good so being late and then not being precise meaning that we can still be behind the ball but if we are not unloading our stroke through the contact point then you know we are not taking advantage of our weight moving forward so i see sometimes players who are moving well but then they just it's static they are static behind the contact point instead of unloading through the contact point and then we all know players and you know we have been part some of those players is that we are just so sloppy with the feet that we will never even have a chance to get you know our way through the contact point uh, we cannot extend the contact point in a hitting zone and have a nice uh, nice pop on the ball so uh, you know there are many reasons you know there's a uh, simply being lazy they're simply being undisciplined and then of course the worst thing is just not being fast enough and and nothing good comes out of those reasons so we have to work hard on the on the fitness part of it that hopefully we are fast enough to get behind the ball that's not enough then we have to be disciplined enough to 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 try to get to that position most of the time and 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 then you know unload through the contact point getting our weight moving through forward so you know it's it's um, it's a lot of stuff that has to happen to hit that great uh, great ball got you for sure Vesa um very you know tough question here but what in your opinion is the key for us to have uh, better footwork more explosive footwork can you give us a few tips about that okay I, I you know I have spent a lot of time over the years trying to figure it out I think that we make a mistake many times that we only think about footwork as a physical activity I believe very strongly that in every sport especially in tennis but in every sport so-called first step actually happens upstairs and the second step happens downstairs and is the physical activity what I mean by that one is that the player has to demonstrate total engagement so the eyes start tracking the ball hopefully you know some good uh, good uh, you know action is happening in upstairs and that uh, that uh, you know player will send a signal to the downstairs legs and that's when the physical activity happens but the player has to be willing to work and willing to move you know that willingness to move is a huge thing and it all starts uh, with your mentality and and how well you track the ball and and how ready you are to move so I, I look at the footwork that the first thing is the mindset and the mentality the second thing is the physical part of it which is of course we can improve with a tons of different kind of fitness work and a tennis specific footwork but without willingness to move and having that uh, being engaged getting a lot of information with the eyes your first step is going to be slow and all the work in the world you can work 18 hours with your first step but if you are not mentally engaged only thing that happens you might become a little bit less slow you never become fast so that's how i kind of look at it that uh, as a coaches we have to motivate and maybe even inspire young players to understand that they have to be totally engaged watching the ball carefully processing information from the eyes and then they have a chance to be have a great footwork and everybody talks about fast first step it actually you have to be fast upstairs before you are fast downstairs they are on the tour you know there are there are plenty of players who move well and they have a great footwork but they are not necessarily super fast um, you know 
actually colleague of mine and actually great friend, Mats Willander, in my book, is one of the great examples of somebody who was extremely fast with his mind and how to see the ball anticipating. But if you would put him to run 100 meters that way, there would be, you know, 5,000 guys who can run faster. But, you know, he was so fast reading the ball and 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 so quick upstairs that um, he actually moved beautifully on the court. Yeah, that's a great point, Vesa. I mean, it all comes down to really the mind. You know, the mind is what's controlling the body. And uh, obviously, when we're feeling tired and things like that, that's an example of when you have to have your mind engaged and focused and pushing you through and things like that. So that's definitely makes a ton of sense. So I also want to, uh, you know, talk about the tactical implications of the contact point. So let's start off with asking you, you know, what does a proper contact point allow the player to do from a tactical standpoint? Okay, now just simply, if and when your contact point is right and you are behind the ball, your ball is a little heavier, a little faster, and there's a quality behind it. So now actually you have a chance to hopefully to dictate. We all would like to be in a position to dictate when we're on the tennis court. But... Um, if you really go to the purpose of a contact point in a, in a tactical point of view in competition, if I play a match against you, my whole purpose is not to make you feel good on the court. And that means to take the ball away from your contact point. That's, that's how you play the game. So, you know, there are four different ways to do it. You know, I can go low, I can go high, I can go to the party, I can, or I can go wide. As long as I don't let you to hit too many balls from your favorite contact point. And that's when the, this game is a great game. It becomes like a chess, chess game in a sense. You try to find your contact point and I try to take it away from you. And, uh, you know, and, you know, so that's why tactically contact point actually, again, determines how well you will be playing. It determines what kind of tactics you can run through what kind of patterns you can do, because we all know if there's no quality in your stroke, you know, more than likely you end up running and just chasing balls. So, uh, you know, that's just an understanding that, uh, you know, when I'm playing that I try to take the ball away from your contact point. When the young player understands that one, they came absolutely close to the next level. Instead of just hitting balls and letting the opponent to find a favorite spot and then wondering that why it feels so busy here on my side of the court. Uh, Vesa, that's really an extremely valuable point there about uh, just finding out you're essentially trying to exploit your opponent's weaknesses by making them uncomfortable on the court, which obviously, uh, you know, from this tactical standpoint, which, uh, I mean, that's a great way to think about the game. So you mentioned some variables, you know, including uh, wide, high, low. Is there one particular uh, type of direction or, or place to put the ball that most makes uh, players uncomfortable? I think that it depends on the player you are playing against. I mean, we all know it's a common sense. You know, you, you play a tall guy, you might want to give them a lot of low balls. Um, you know, take their, take their contact point away in that sense. Or you play a sort of guy with a one-handed backhand, then you want to extend their contact point really high over their shoulder. With, uh, with the serves and returns, you know, you know, you play somebody who has a great return on the wings, then you want to s- squeeze their contact point to their body. And so, you know, there are a lot of common sense options. It's just that I feel like we don't think about them enough when we are teaching young players how to play this game and and we have always pl- we all have played a player who doesn't look good but does these things really well and actually makes us not to hit the ball well and we always wonder what is happening here how can i be losing to this guy you know normally i hit a such a great ball and we don't notice that this guy didn't give us anything to our contact point they they might look really bad you know, looking, you know, how they hit the ball, but they keep the ball away from our contact point, and that's, that doesn't feel good. I always tell the young players that, you know, you know, the tennis is not like a figure skating. There are no extra points for the style. You know, you, you just, uh, you know, it's all about winning that point, and taking the ball away from your opponent's contact point is the best way to win in this game. It has been the last 100 years, and it will be still 
the next uh, next hundred years. Yeah, I mean, that's totally true, obviously, because, for example, like I have a semi-Western slash Western grip. And so I have a lot of trouble, for example, with low balls. Or maybe you play somebody with continental, like you said, the, the favorite contact point is lower, so you hit higher balls, so things like that. And I think that we got a great um, lesson, you know, in Australian Open final uh, this year. You know, we know that the past 10 years, Nadal has been very successful taking the ball away from a Roacher's uh, contact point on the backhand side. And I think that Roacher, you know, was slicing a lot because, you know, the ball came too high. And whatever reasons now in his late years, in that tournament, Federer totally found his contact point in front of him. He took the ball early and we could all see how he was hitting his forehand. And I bet that he might be even kicking himself at why he didn't do it the last 10 years with Nadal, because Nadal was absolutely killing him just from one side, taking the ball away from his contact point. And that's a great example for everybody that Federer made actually uh, in his he's 35 years old and he's still tweaking on his game and makes these tactical changes. So the reason he beat Nadal, the big reason is he hit a lot of balls from the backhand side in his contact point. Nadal wasn't able to take it high anymore because, you know, Na uh, Federer was just stepping in and take it on the rise, which is... Sounds easy, it's very difficult, but it was just a great, great lesson for everybody how adjustment to find that contact point really pays dividends. Exactly, yeah. I mean, and that's like you said, for the past 10 years, especially on the clay, Nadal would just hit every single like heavy forehand, high to Roger's backhand, Roger couldn't do anything. Um, so that's an example, again, like you're saying, of making the players uncomfortable. Great stuff. I mean, also as well, like maybe we can touch upon the emotional implications uh, during competition of, of contact point as well. Yeah, I would actually, if we have time, I would actually say one more thing about the tactical. You know, it's um, there are external factors that also have an effect, meaning that, uh, you know, the court surface, the speed of the court, type of the balls, different kind of balls. So those are the things that uh, that the players have to take into account, and it actually has an effect on their contact point. You know, you know, there's a there's a difference. You know, playing on grass and on red clay, there's difference between heavy balls and flat. You know, you know, fast balls, and those are the things why this game is so incredibly difficult to master, because you know the top players are dealing with these things all the time. And uh, with the young players, we have to prepare them to be able to deal with also with external factors, not only the opponent, but the, the court and everything, uh, the wind or anything like that, you know, it has an effect on the contact point. And we, that's why we have to send the message to the young players that you have to fight and find that contact point in order to be able to compete well. Yeah, Vesa, I mean, that's great advice. Um, you know, a contact point is just uh, critical, but... It's, I guess, to some who are listening, uh, obviously they know the value, but they might be, after you mention all the variables, they might say, oh gosh, like how can I even find it? There's so many things to consider. But what would you tell these uh, these players? I, again, like I mentioned it earlier, trust your, trust your feeling. I mean, that we have all hit that ball sometimes when it feels like nothing. And you know what? Chances are that was your right contact point. So just be aware how it feels and, and be aware where the ball was when it felt like nothing. And then you just try to repeat it. So again, just be mentally engaged, listen to your body, you know, feeling how it feels to hit the tennis ball. And I think that sometimes we just, uh, we are too mechanical, you know, we, as a coaches, we just keep on putting instructions in and we talk too much instead of letting the player to feel what is the right spot to hit the ball? And when, when we, we all know how it feels when it feels great. Yeah, that for sure. That's true. I mean, uh, you know, never uh, try to complicate it too much. You'll overload the uh, the players. So fantastic stuff. And um, yeah, as, as we mentioned, you know, I just want to touch upon some emotional implications of 
uh, you know, during competition of the contact point and, and things like that, if you don't mind talking about that. Yeah, that's why I, I think that this contact point is so loaded concept because it, you know, we can talk about technique, tactics, physical, footwork, and then, of course, mental, emotional. And what I mean by there is that uh, contact point actually, again, you know, it defines your well-being on the court. Again, when you hit well and you feel good, you play better. Emotionally, you are more relaxed. You, you enjoy what you are doing. So just the quality of the hit has an effect on how do you feel emotionally. Uh, mentally, we all know that what really makes a difference in any level is the confidence. And again, having that contact point working for you, you just simply feel more confident. You have a belief what you are doing because there's a quality in your hitting. And again, mentality-wise, your confidence level moves up. And also just the simple simple fact that you are happy with your hitting and stroking and there's a quality behind it, just the fact that it feels good has an has a positive impact on the, your confidence level. So we all know that this game becomes much more fun and more winning happens when you are feeling good and you are feeling confidence. Confident. When we are not feeling confident, that's that's when we are not hitting the ball well. That's when our opponent has been very successful taking the ball away from our contact point. That is when we struggle. That's when our decision making breaks down. That's when we get tired. That's when we start to beat us, beat, beat ourselves up. That's when our body language goes down. So basically, I'm using the term well-being. You know, when you feel good on the court, good things will start to happen. And that's why the contact point is such an important thing because Again, when you hit the ball the right way, it has quality behind it. Now, hopefully you are dictating and, and hopefully your opponent is doing a little bit extra running. And that feels good. Definitely. Feels good for us and tough for them. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, as you mentioned, again, you know, having the opponent make them uncomfortable. But on the opposite side of that coin, what advice would you give players? You know, and we all have these days. We're on the court. We're playing against a tough opponent. And we feel like we're just we're not contacting the ball in the right place. We're late. And it's kind of uh, frustrating. Any, you know, tips on, you know, what we should be doing or thinking at in uh, these moments to help us kind of reset and then find our contact point? First of all, I think that just to acknowledge the fact that looks like I'm having a tough match in my hands, you know, that you are now you are ready to go to work. You are ready to maybe take your footwork to the next level, uh, because if you don't, then you are going to lose. And if you don't fix it, then you are going to lose a little bit faster than you would really like to. So basically to to make a commitment that, hey, this is the this is the day where I have been practicing. This is the day that I'm going to challenge my footwork. I'm challenged, going to challenge my mentality. Can I put more quality into the ball from the good position against the quality opponent? There is a danger that when we are playing against somebody who is good and who might be winning in the sense that we start to rush, we start to you know, force the ball. And again, I urge young players to have a discipline to you know, to take a big cut off the ball only when the ball is in the right spot and they have found their contact point. Because we all make mistakes when we are forcing the ball and the ball is away from the contact point. So there's not too much that you can do when you play against somebody who's really good, other than that be, be re mentally, physically and emotionally ready for the tough afternoon. Take it as a challenge, but you cannot compromise your contact point. You have to fight for it even harder. And uh, if it's not enough and, and you lose against somebody who's good, at least, you know, some learning took place. You actually got better, you got tougher, but the attitude is a big part of it. That's why, you know, contact point has an effect on ment in the mental and emotional side. But there are no quick fixes or anything, you know. It's just that you just have to work harder and see if you can be as a little bit tougher than you normally are. How do you uh, help your players develop this toughness and discipline and willingness to, you know, do whatever it takes to reach the next level? That's uh, that's a tough question. Um, I don't think that I have a clear-cut answer. It's um, I have a, and here in JTCC, we have a coaching philosophy. We have had all kinds of philosophies over the year, and I just, older I get, the more simplistic I become. I don't know if that's good or bad, but, that's how it is. And at the moment, 
my coaching philosophy is that as a coach, my application is that my students, they trust their training. Three words, trust your training. And all the training has to be done so the player will trust their training because only when you trust your training, you have a chance to hopefully play a good point when it's 6-5 and a third, 30 all. And it takes thousands of hours to get to that point, but you ha there has to be a trust. And I also, again, feel that uh, when, uh, when, the, when it feels good to hit the ball, then you are trusting what you are doing. But um, I spend a lot of time trying to get the players to work really hard so they feel like they, they have earned the trust, that they can trust their game, they trust their training because hopefully they have done it for a long time and hopefully they have done it well. Uh, there are no shortcuts. There are no, you know, I can keep on telling the young kid that, hey, you are great, you are this and that. It's just a motivational pep talk. It's not going to hold up in a, in a, in a real when you are facing the break point in the third. So there has to be a healthy feeling and understanding from the player's point of view that, hey, I have done the work, I trust my training, and now I'm putting on the line and see what happens. Yeah, Vesa, I mean, whenever I step in JTCC for, you know, a USC League match or a tournament, I see that slogan and it's uh, very motivating. And I mean, it re really, that's it, because you know, uh, if you haven't been training, uh, you know, you know that you're probably not going to be very successful. But if you put in so many hours and you just tell yourself that, you know, that I've worked so hard for this and, and I know I'll succeed because I've, I've done what it takes, then I mean, that's the way to go. Um, so, yeah. And, and again, as an athlete, you know, we know when we haven't done the work, doesn't matter what we say, whatever. I mean, we know that if we didn't go all out in the training, you know, every athlete knows it deep inside. And, 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 you know, when, if that's the case, you don't have the real confidence. And, and we have to earn that trust in a sense that you have done the work so you can really look at the mirror and look at, hey, you know, I'm ready to compete. It doesn't guarantee that I'm going to win, but at least I'm ready to compete. I trust what I have done. But, uh, you know, when we cut corners, and it's everything in life, you know, when you cut corners, you don't have real confidence. You're just hoping to get lucky and this and that, but it unfortunately it doesn't work uh, work most of the time. So we all, as an athlete, we all know when we have done things the right way and we have done it long enough to feel that, hey, I have some real confidence. Exactly, Vesa. It's the worst feeling in the world when you uh, you know you have I know. done it. Yeah, we've all been there, I'm sure. Uh, we, we, we know exactly how it feels. <laughs> yeah, it's not good at all. Um, yeah, and if assuming you don't have any other comments on that, I was also uh, wanted to touch upon, uh, you know, kind of the advantages uh, for under 10 players regarding contact point training. Okay, no, I, I think that, um, you know, over the years, um, I have always used modified balls and the rackets and courts as a coaching tool. I, I'm never big for mandates, you know. I, you know, I don't agree that let's say U.S. State goes and mandates that everything has to be with this and these balls. I think that the coaches use modified tennis balls and everything as a coaching tools. I happen to, I'm a big believer that uh, ten and under tennis is absolutely going to increase the quality of players, quality of the enjoyment that they have, for the simple fact that. Uh, they will get more quality repetitions with the right kind of punch of the ball. And we all know that tennis is a game of repetitions, but they have to be quality repetitions. And with, the, you know, is it red, you know, orange or green, as long as the ball is close to that right contact point and you get the repetitions in like that, it's only going to help you in the long run. Instead of having, you know, kids to hitting the balls over their heads and stuff, they get reps, but those are not quality repetitions. So I think that the 10 and under 10 is, is, is fantastic in that sense that, you know, 80% of the time when they are hitting the ball is actually close to their contact point. And now they can get the repetitions done. Uh, you know, also, it gives them time to move. You know, let's say that they play with the green dot or orange, it gives them time to move so they are not reaching the ball all the time. 
Uh, the ball is not too fast. So now they get quality reps with their footwork. So then hopefully they get most of the time their legs behind the ball. And again, they can hit a quality ball, which is extremely important for somebody who is seven, eight or nine. And you think about when they put a half a million reps like that together, some good things will start to happen. And just the fact that there's more quality hitting, it simply increases the enjoyment of the hitting. And I believe that more and more kids are going to stay in the game because it feels so good. They have a control and it simply feels good to hit the ball. You know, it, it doesn't feel good to hit the ball here with an extreme grip. But, you know, you hit it close to your contact point. I, I think that more game, more kids will stay in the game and, uh, you know, they will motivate it to, to even to go further and further and train harder because they are being successful. But like I mentioned it, I'm a, I'm a big believer that it's a great coaching tool, but um, it doesn't need to be a must and mandated that, hey, you know, from seven to nine, you have to do this and this. It doesn't need to be that way in my book, but it's a fantastic coaching tool. In, in our place, uh, you know, let's say some even some great players like Dennis Kutla or Francis Tiafo, when they came back from tournaments or they came back from, they had an injury, we put them to hit with the foam balls, even when they were really good, just to clean up the technique and, and just feel good about the hitting. And it's just a great coaching tool in, in, in any level. Well, I really appreciate that, Vesa. I mean, that's something that especially you coaches and also parents should really highly consider, you know, using. So that's fantastic stuff. I um, also want to ask you uh, a couple other questions. Um, one, uh, what's the biggest myth that you've heard about contact point or maybe even technique in general that you'd like to just dispel for the audience? I think that uh, just the fact that some people don't pay enough attention to it, I think that that itself is a big problem. You know, we spend a lot of time, you know, getting the creep right. We spend a lot of time getting the elbow to 37 degrees or whatever it is. We spend a lot of time, perfect shoulder turn and this and that. But we actually fail to inform or teach that all that stuff is there to be very effective at the right contact point. Uh, we spend a lot of time trying to master our, our follow through. Uh, we think that um, follow through is a fundamental. It's not really a fundamental. Follow through is actually a result what happens at the contact point. And that's why, you know, Roger Federer ha can have 15 different follow throughs because it depends what he, he does different stuff in the contact point. So I think that the fact that the contact point should be the center of the learning and 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 everything has to happen really well in that contact point. The fact that we don't pay enough attention to that one is, is the biggest mistake that we do. Yeah, you know, I definitely agree with that. It's uh, amazing stuff. Uh, kind of a fun question, I suppose. Uh, out of all the players that you've watched, coached, or seen, who is a player that you admire for, um, you know, the great you know, contact point that they consistently have, if you could name someone? Just in the high level, I think that um, you can really see the players who make the game look easy. And let's say, let's say Federer. The reason, you know, he has that style because he's so good and his contact point is in the right spot most of the time. He finds that contact point. It, everything looks so easy. Of course, it's a stylish thing, but, uh, you know, then you look at how hard uh, somebody like uh, Nadal works with his footwork to get to that contact point, you know. Hitting 80% of the forehands and, and finding the contact point to that inside out forehand or inside in. I mean, you really appreciate how hard he works with his footwork to get to that point. And then, of course, you have something like Dojkovic. If you really look at him, I mean, that, I mean, there got to be 80% of the balls are hit in the very close to the ideal contact point. And that's just a testament to his unbelievable engagement and footwork and everything and and that's why he can uh, you know you cannot hit through these players you know they move so well and they hit most of the ball from the contact point so basically how i look at it all the best ones hit the great ball from the good contact point then 
rest of us, you know, we struggle because, you know, we are not as good finding that contact point and as that might be the reason why, you know, we don't have too many slams in our, you know, in 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 in, in our belt. But, uh, but, you know, all the best ones, all the pros who are making a living, you know what? They understand how important that contact point is and what happens at the contact point. And when the young player recognizes that fact, that's always I, I find out that that's when they take their game to the next level. Not that uh, they learned a lot of new stuff. No, it's just the fact that most of the time they hit a quality ball and it's because they found their contact point. Yeah, just powerful stuff. As I encourage all of you to really, when you're watching tennis, pay more attention to the contact point from great players and, and see the effects of that. Uh, it's fantastic. So, you know, for audience who has watched this, uh, you know, fantastic uh, presentation and interview uh, and wants to improve their game, especially their contact point, what type of actionable piece of advice would you give them? If and when you will go and get a private lesson or you work with a coach, Please walk to the coach and ask the coach, let's define my contact point in every stroke. That is the, the most important thing that you have to find out. And please use an expert help, the coach. If the coach doesn't know or not willing to do it, then you have to find another coach. It's that simple. That's how important it is. But, you know, make sure that, you know, you know what you are looking for and then get some tips how to get there. But uh, make sure you you know where your forehand volley contact point should be, your backhand volley, slice, backhand drive, forehand drive. You know, you know, you have to know. And maybe coach, like I said early on, maybe coach just shows you, puts the racket and, hey, how about this one? Try this one. But make sure that you have a good idea where the ball is supposed to be when you hit your best ball. Gotcha. Great stuff, Vesa. And, uh, for everyone who's in Maryland, Virginia, D.C., around there, you definitely go to the J, uh, JTCC, Junior Tennis Champion Center. They have some amazing coaches there to help you with uh, finding your contact point and improving your game. But, uh, Vesa, I obviously, I just want to educate the audience a bit about you. So can you kind of tell us, uh, you know, what, what you're doing at the moment and what you're up to? First of all, I'm a very lucky guy. I have surrounded myself with the great coaches. We like to think that, you know, a lot of, eager young players that keeps us all young and challenging so uh, basically what we are doing we are trying to use tennis as the way not only become a good tennis player but i i believe that the tennis is the number one sport in the world to teach life lessons to be a really successful in life i i think that you know to be a great problem solver you cannot play this game if you cannot solve problems we all know how important that is you know whatever you do and to become successful uh, i think that just the fact that tennis is the basically it's you lose a lot uh, learning how to lose and and bounce back it's nothing is more important in life you know you have a you have a choice you know when somebody you know beats you up on the tennis court hey you know am i done or am i trying harder and I think that that lesson is super, super important, uh, super important in, in, in life. Uh, just the fact that this game is so difficult to master, it only takes a lifetime to learn it, teaches us the hard work. And, uh, you know, again, we know how important that is in, in, in life to be successful. Um, you know, goal setting. This is a great sport to set up goals. Same thing, again, a great life skill. So in my earlier, younger years, you know, I was all about, you know, winning Kalamazoo's and, and Orange Balls, and it was all about winning. And now slowly I'm maturing, you know, like to think that, and, and I'm starting to see the really the big picture that, hey, we can use this great game to, to, to make the players really successful, whatever they decide to do with their life. And that's why I, I strongly believe that tennis is absolutely the best sport to get ready for the challenges of the life. So that's what we are doing in a sense that uh, as a byproduct, then, you know, the young players have a chance to go to college, get a scholarship, play four years, great college tennis. Again, nothing is more valuable than that. And then 
those few individuals who are just so freaky talented, they might be good enough to play in the very highest level and, and you know, turn professional. But this game is a great game for everybody. And if the coaches have a right mentality and, and, and you know, they can inspire your kids to get better, you know, it's just going to pay back many times over when they get a little bit older. So that's what we try to do. That's an extremely admirable outlook, and that's what it is, Vesa. I mean, I, I also love just telling people, I, I mean, tennis will teach you discipline, hard work, willpower, mental toughness, uh, you know, fitness, uh, on and on. And uh, using that, you know, you, you see so many successful uh, people who play tennis who are, you know, in the real world as well, uh, you know, working and all that. Um, so it's just a wonderful sport. And we're all very privileged to be a part of it. And um, yeah, so I really appreciate that. And I, I, I appreciate you putting this seminar together because, you know, we can never get enough messages out there. What a great game we have. It's, it's uh, you know, I have been around a long time and in Europe and here in States and we have to grow the game. You know, the, you know, it's not right that tennis is number 17 or 18 important sport in the United States. I mean that, you know, it's just not right. I, I don't like the fact that skateboarding is getting better athletes than tennis. And, uh, you know, I think that we all have an application that, you know what, we have to grow the sport because this is absolutely the great sport. It's, uh, it's tough, you know, that rest of the world, basically tennis is you know, maybe number two sport in their country after soccer. Here instead, you know, it's 17 or 18 or 19. And that we have to hopefully get to the point like it used to be in 17 and 80s when the tennis boom was taking over that, hey, you know, everybody was playing the game and everybody was excited about it. And that's how we create future Grand Slam champions. It's not from the top. It's actually from the bottom up. And I think that, you know, it's a long term thing, but um, we have to grow the game. And I, I appreciate your putting together this seminar because, you know, all this stuff helps hopefully to grow the game. Exactly. Vess. I really appreciate the kind words. And obviously, again, you know, thank you for everything you've been doing. The game is uh, so wonderful. And I think we all have to do our part. Like you said, you know, we can't just, uh, you know, collect a paycheck and then go home. It, it's, it really would be useful if you would just try to educate those around you about, uh, you know, the benefits of the game and take them out to the court and hit and things like that, you know, post on social media, get things that, you know, all that. So, um, Vesa, um, you know, again, I can't thank you enough for being on the uh, Tennis Techniques Summit. Uh, you really gave us some wonderful and valuable advice about uh, how the contact point can really help you elevate your game uh, and your career if you can focus more on that uh, very important concept. So, uh Thanks again for being on the summit, and I look forward to connecting with you soon and making the short drive out to JTCC uh, as well and seeing you. So Okay, look, I appreciate it, and come to see me. I haven't seen your contact points since, you know, 15 years, so I, I need to check it out. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, oh, man, it's I not better, only uh... talk what we do, so let's check it out. So I'm more than happy to take a look at it. Thank you very much, Vesa. I'll, I'll try to shore it up before I get to okay. you, but... Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks Thank you. All righty then. I really hope that you enjoyed my interview with Coach Vesapanka, as well as that alrighty then reference from whatever movie it is that's from. I forget already. Pet Detective, maybe. <laughs> uh, not really that great with movies, but um, in any case, I would really appreciate it if you would leave a review for the Tennis Files podcast. So if you got value from this episode and you haven't left a review yet. And I definitely would appreciate it. I think we have about 100 ratings. Uh, I don't know if it's ratings and reviews or just ratings. But yeah, we have a lot of them on. But uh, yours would help so much because each one helps push the podcast up in the ratings. And what that does is it brings it more to the forefront of the search results so that people can, can see the Tennis Files podcast and then benefit from it. So you are doing a great service to your fellow tennis players, many of whom you won't play, so don't worry about that. <laughs> but yeah, I also would like to leave you with a quote, as I often love to do at the end of the show, and this one is by Eric Hoffer. And Eric said, In times of change, learners inherit the earth, while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. I had to read this quote twice, um, but obviously there's a distinguishing 
meaning between learners and learned, if I'm pronouncing the latter correctly. You know, as long as you're a learner, you keep learning and you're able to adapt. But if you're the learned or learned, um, then you had learned at one point, but you're no longer progressing and learning. So that's why you are equipped to deal with the past. All right. Uh, and that does apply to tennis as well. So thanks again for listening. I hope that you're practicing your game, training, um, recording yourself, playing, analyzing, and so forth. And with that, I will see you on the next episode of the Tennis Files podcast. This is Maribon Aranchad signing out.